Hi everyone and welcome to the second episode of Research Bites where I present small bite-sized lectures uh, to help you understand certain very core concepts of clinical research including some biostatistics and manuscript preparation. In episode 1, we saw how doing good clinical research can lead to an influence on a lot of different things including you know, patient care, uh, grants, funding, you know, uh, how government organizations look at uh, and allocation of funds and many other things. I have been very frequently asked about how to read a scientific research paper that has already been published in a peer-reviewed journal. Let us look at why you should be familiar with this topic before learning and understanding how to do this. One of the main reasons why you should be familiar with reading a scientific research paper is to decide whether the results published in the scientific paper are credible enough to apply to your patients and clinical practice that is will it improve patient outcomes in my humble opinion this is one of the most critical aspects of being a successful medical practitioner leaders in the field understand the importance of reading manuscripts meticulously hence are able to translate published literature into clinical practice and improve their outcomes much before others their opinions are valued based on their ability to interpret published papers. If you read a paper casually and apply results to patients, the outcomes may not match your expectations and may lead to unhappy patients. Additionally, you may want to upgrade to a new machine or purchase some new uh, medical equipment based on validation studies. This is a major decision that most of you will face sometime or the other. Making the best decision based on the best scientific evidence is of paramount importance. In addition to other considerations such as finance and return on investment. Another reason for interpreting papers published in scientific literature are to understand the lacunae which are existing in that particular niche field and to plan your own studies based on what has not been done. Many of you listening today may be uh, postgraduate students or maybe thesis guides where you need to allot uh, important thesis once every six months or maybe once every year. Keeping an eye out on published literature and understanding what has not been done, that is gaps on literature, will enable you to choose excellent topics for your, for your students and churn out studies which can be published in the best journals. After having delved into why you should be good at reading scientific uh, published literature, uh, let's now take a closer look at how you can do this. This is a stepwise process and can be very easily learned, exactly like how you can learn steps of surgery and get very good at it. Um, it requires a little bit of persistence and patience, but trust me, you can actually use these steps that I'm going to describe and be very good at uh, reading scientific literature. Step one is read full text articles. Most of us, unfortunately, are in the habit of reading the abstracts of the manuscripts published and that too the aims and then directly the conclusions of the abstract. Though this approach is very convenient, it is seldom helpful. So when the title of the paper appears interesting to you, make time and try and read the full text of the paper. If you don't have enough time, you can consider reading the abstract and you know, try and read the method section first and if that interests you, then read the results and try to decipher what the paper is probably trying to say. And if the results also interest you, then make an attempt to read the full text, especially the discussion written by the authors before uh, you know making um, impressions about the paper and taking that paper to your patients. Screening abstracts on a periodic basis is a very good idea to keep yourself updated on how current literature is actually evolving. Step two deals with when you are actually reading the full text. Start with reading the method section of the paper. Try and see the inclusion and exclusion criteria which have been used for the paper because results from this paper will be applicable to your patients, to those included in the study and not to those who are excluded. Then look at the main intervention in the study and how different procedures were carried out. The best papers often use a flowchart and help you very easily understand what was exactly done at each step. Try and replicate these as closely as possible when applying this knowledge to your own patients. Any deviations from described protocols may lead to suboptimal outcomes. Finally, in the methods section, look at the primary outcome measures, exactly how they were defined, and then look at the statistical analysis section of the paper if that makes sense to you. To better understand biostatistics, you can look at uh, some of the modules on Sen Gupta's Research Academy, especially the module on biostatistics, which helps you understand biostatistics in a very simple way. Uh, manner from a clinical point of view. Step 3 is to read the results section of the paper very carefully. A well-written paper should have the primary outcome measure being described in the beginning of the results section. While looking at the numbers, try and concentrate on the 95% confidence intervals which are given 
or the range which is given along with the mean and standard deviation. These intervals and ranges give us the entire spectrum of possibility of the results. For example, if a hemoglobin A1c is reduced by 2% from baseline by a new drug and the 95% confidence interval varies from 1.2 to 4%, that means that 95% of the people will experience a drop in hemoglobin A1c which will range between 1.2 and 4%. So if you start this new medication to your patients, you can expect a drop in hemoglobin HbA1c between 1.2 and 4%. As you can see, this interval makes a lot more sense than the mean value alone. Another valuable thing to see along with these is the p-value which has been provided with the different results. We will have another session where we discuss more in detail about p-values, how to interpret them and what are the determinants of the, these p-values. Step 4 is to read the discussion of the full text. The first paragraph of the discussion is where the authors actually summarize what they exactly found and what are the points that they want to actually discuss in this paper. This is the part of the paper where you will get that one liner that you want to take home with you and uh, apply to your patients and tell your colleagues about. Reading through the discussion will also make you very well aware of the actual context of where this paper and its results sits in the overall scheme of things uh, about that particular disease or uh, you know drug treatment. Also watch out for the points of caution that the authors may provide in the discussion. You know, for example, they may talk about certain very rare side effects, uh, you know, which are going to be in very small print, but you know, this is where you will find that kind of information as well. The last step about reading scientific research papers is to critique the paper. What is its rationale? What is the study question? Were the methods sound enough to find the answers to the study question? Were results presented lucidly for you to understand things clearly? And were results discussed in context? of the existing literature. Once you have positive answers to all these, you are ready to apply these results to your own patients. You can also use some internationally accepted checklists to evaluate papers so that you can understand them thoroughly. Using these checklists is a fascinating experience and I recommend everyone to go through equatornetwork.org that you can see on your screens and try this exercise at least once. In summary, the ability to read a scientific research paper is really very important to apply new knowledge to your patients purchase equipment and identify study questions for your own research. Reading full text articles is the best way to accomplish this. Using a checklist based approach is probably the best uh, foot forward so that you don't miss out on uh, you know, certain non-negotiable items which are missing from the paper. And you know, if you start finding a lot of deficiencies in the paper based on some of these checklists that you use, uh, you know, that will tell you that the paper is probably not good enough for you to apply to your own patients. That brings us to the end of episode 2 of Research Bites. And I hope that you have enjoyed the content that I have presented to you. Please explore our courses on senguptaresearchacademy.com where there are many modules which teach, teach you nuances of literature review, of biostatistics, manuscript writing and a lot uh, of other things which uh, can help you do good client scientific clinical research and publish papers. In episode 3, we will try and look at how to apply clinical trials to your clinical practice to improve patient care. Thanks for joining me and until next time, uh, take care and stay safe. Thank you very much.